Hi everyone, it is wonderful to see you and to spend time with you tonight. My name is Katerina Stojkova. I am the founder and senior editor of Accents Publishing. We are an independent press in Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you uh, for being for taking the time to be part of our Accents Book Club. Every other week, we plan to bring you an author of a book published by Accents Publishing and focus on this author and that book for an hour. Last week, we uh, actually last time, two weeks ago, we launched a series with Lita Kendrick and her book, Ant Luckier. And in two weeks, we'll feature Christopher McCurry and his book, Open Burning. So this is Ant Luckier by Lita Kendrick. This is um, Open Burning by Chris McCurry. And um, which they will have in paperback as well. So to learn more about the series, about accents publishing, submission opportunities, etc., cetera, um, or to join our mailing list, uh, write to accents.publishing at gmail.com and we'll, we'll give you all the information that you need. So Accents Publishing is proud to bring you the junkie who the Junkie Who Loved Horses. Uh, this is an anthology edited by poet Sonia de Vries. This book contains um, uh, this book contains beautifully authentic poems by formerly formerly incarcerated men. These poems do not leave the reader indifferent. They teach surprise, delight, break your heart. We are thankful for the hard work Sonia has put into this collection and honored to be the press to carry it out into the world. Poet Frank X. Walker says this about the book. These poems are raw and unflinching. They are filled with regret and possibility. They pay tribute to those loved and lost and confess their humanity on each and every page. If you need to es escape inside, this cake is a saw. So that is Frank X. Walker. His book arrived today from the printer, Masked Man, Black, Pandemic and Protest Poems. Um, I want to say that I met Sonia uh, at the Spalding MFA program, we started together, uh, you know, the same semester, we were in the same workshop. Then mm -hmm. um, that was truly very special. I immediately fell in love with her poetry and her spirit. To me, she's always been an example of a compassionate human being who puts her time and efforts where her heart is and her heart is and has always been on the side of social justice and empowerment of those who have been placed in a position of disadvantage. I've always admired that about her, amongst many other things. We are here today to celebrate Sonia and her wonderful anthology, The Junkie Who Loved Horses. This is a remarkable book with a remarkable history and Sonia will take the time to talk about it and read from it. After her reading, we will have the opportunity to ask questions and have a discussion. Also, I encourage you to contact her directly to obtain your copy of the book. Many of you probably know that Sonia is not only a sensitive editor. She is also an accomplished poet. Uh, and I've asked her to read several of her own poems towards the end of the session, maybe after the uh, Q&A. Now, help me welcome Sonia de Vries. <laughs> Thank you, Katerina. Um, 
you know, this has been an amazing process, um, both the making of the book, which I'll talk about in a moment, but working with Katarina and Accents Press has been just such a wonderful dynamic experience, Katarina. And I thank you so much for your involvement, your passion, um, for really helping me with certain pieces like the wonderful cover. I love the cover so much. Um, and, and just really engaging with the work. Um, you know, I have some experience with, with um, other presses and this is the first time I've really felt that kind of engagement and I, I appreciate it so much. Um, and of course, you know, many memories um, of having known each other for so long. Katarina is also an amazing poet and I wanna mention that I have used her books in my work that led to this book. <laughs> um, there was a, um, the, the last few sessions I used Katarina's newest book and there was a poem um, on the balcony, a guzzle or gazelle, however you wanna say it. Um, and I used that and not only did the people I was working with totally engage, but they wrote their own. And it was just a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. So all of this stuff feeds on, um, on itself, on each other. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual work. Um, I got to work with a program called Arts and Healing that later changed its name to Arts Thrive. And now because of COVID-19 no longer exists. Um, but I got to start working with them in 2011. Uh, Kristen Hughes started that program at, uh, as part of the Kentucky Center for the Arts. And um, she had lots of different artists who would go into the community, into institutions with the idea that people engaging with art forms was an essential part of their healing. And they didn't have any writers, they didn't have any poets. And I heard about the program, so I went to her and I said, how about trying a poet? And so she was like, okay, we'll try it. And the first class that I went to was actually at the VA. And I worked with um, the veterans for a couple months and then, and then Kristen said, okay, yeah, we're gonna you know, put you in the program permanently. And uh, so that's how that came. And then I started working at the VOA as well. I worked in many different institutions, but this book is from the VOA. Um, I wanna say that the, the people at the VOA, it changed over the years. I was there eight years. And I would go every other Friday, just about for two hour sessions. And um, many, many of the men were formerly incarcerated and still under the control of the Department of Corrections. Um, some of them were veterans, some of them were houseless men. Um, and during the time I was there, I met a couple of trans women who were also in that program. So it was a variety of people, um, but yes, many of them, I'd say the majority of them, uh, had been incarcerated one time or another. Um, and many of them struggled, you know, they were also coal miners, musicians, tattoo artists, plumbers, you know, they were, they were people from all over the place. Although the uh, thing that most of them had in common was poverty. Um, you don't find very many people with money in prison um, or in these kind of programs um, because of the unjust, so-called justice system. Um, so, you know, and I got to know these guys and um, it was amazing. I would go in there um, and I, I'll be honest, I usually didn't plan because I never knew what the energy was gonna be like, how many people were gonna be in the group, what was gonna be going on. I could walk in and they had just had a raid. You know, the police had come in and turned up their beds and, you know, they'd be in a really bad mood and really angry and they would come in and, um, and I would have to adjust or just kind of improvise on what we were going to work on in that in those two hours. Or, you know, sometimes rarely <laughs> they're in a very peaceful mood. Usually it was pretty rowdy. I mean, I had anywhere from 30 to 50 people in there, in that room down in the basement of the VOA building. And, uh, and it was usually just me and Kristen until we started asking for someone else from the VOA to be in there. And, um, you know, people would often ask me, well, wasn't there a lot of resistance? And there was sometimes to poetry and we would have conversations, you know, some guy would say, well, I don't write poetry. 
you know, poetry's for sissies. I remember one guy said that. And I said, really? Tell me, tell me more about that. And, you know, <laughs> I would engage with it a little. And then I would say, well, you know, if you feel like writing at any point during these two hours, just start writing. Otherwise, you know, you can just listen. I never tried to push anybody. I would try to engage them, but I wouldn't um, push them because I figured they had been pushed and told what to do for most of their lives. Um, I was not there to do that. I was there to encourage them to express themselves. We ended up having conversations about how much um, toxic masculinity can hinder the process of regaining your humanity. And these are conversations that I would just maybe like, you know, ask a question and they, they would start talking about it. Yeah, we're, we're told that we're not supposed to cry. We're not supposed to be sad. We're not supposed to feel grief. And then they would pour it out onto these pages, you know? And they wrote about everything, everything from their children that they were missing. Uh, we did persona poems. So they wrote from the perspective of their children and mothers, which was always, you know, people ended up crying in there. You'd get these, you know, men standing in front of the room with just tears running down their faces. And it was such a, such an amazing process um, all the time. You know, I remember walking in there after my brother died and I wasn't sure I was gonna be able to teach. And my supervisor, Kristen Hughes, was so wonderful. She said, Sonia, just tell them, tell them what's going on. I'm sure they'll be able to relate. And of course they could, you know? And, and that day I remember they all wrote these beautiful poems of loss. And, and one of them even wrote me a poem about me losing my brother. You know, it just generated this amazing, authentic, open, environment, you know, and another time I had gotten arrested for a social justice um, action. And, um, you know, I didn't know anybody knew and I walked in and there were 50 men in there and they started applauding. <laughs> and they said, you're just like us, you're an OG. <laughs> you know? It was great, <laughs> you know, and it just, um, yeah, I, I really am missing that work. Sometimes we had to have visitors, nurses uh, groups come in and we would integrate them in and sometimes do these um, poems where they would tell each other pieces of their own story and then write from the other person's perspective. This really, it um, I think helped me regain my um, sense of the power of poetry working with these groups the power of poetry to heal and connect and validate and give people a voice. And, um, and I'm really, really excited that um, today, one of the people that I wrote with in there is here on this call, Mike. And um, so I'm gonna have him start and we can talk more about the program itself and stuff afterwards, but I wanna read some of these poems. So Mike is gonna read the poem of his that is in the book. Are you there, Mike? Yeah, oh. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Of you course. Got the floor. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Mike. Um, uh, you know, Sonia, first off, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm truly humbled by this. Um, you know, there's nothing like uh, never being published and then seeing something you write in a book. Um, I've never experienced that before. So, I, you know, truly, I want to thank you for that. Um, when, whenever you brought the book to me, I was in a dark place and, uh, this was something that really, um, inspired me and motivated me to keep going. So thank you for that. Um, uh, speaking of, uh, arts and healing, um, that was actually where I met you at. And, uh, I've worked with you at the VOA as well as the VA and, um, uh, Kristen is awesome as well. I just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, but I remember I, uh, the piece that is in this book, um, I wrote it on the day that I met you. And um, I remember you telling me, um, it, you complimented me on my writing. I was really, um, I thought that I wasn't that good. I thought, you know, oh, I haven't done this in a long time. I was in a real dark place. And uh, I remember you complimented me on that, on, on my, my writing ability. And it motivated me to get back into writing more. And uh, while that's kind of come and gone in the past few years, it's kept me trying again. And I so I really appreciate that, Sonia. 
Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and get into it. Um, in the book, it's on page 18. It's called black memories. I had rarely saw grass and the sun always seemed dim An eclipse that forever lasts a trap that seemed to keep me domestic tornadoes, TVs and chairs thrown about without a doubt. It seemed my only way out was the hustle. But with officers on alert, that plan was quick to fizzle. I was forced to, I was forced to fight to survive and get mine where I'm from. It was a certain way of life that meant almost definite death. Either you die or you escape or go to jail and you never forget. Thanks, guys. Mm, thank you so much, Mike. It's so, so great to have you on here. You know, one of the things that was always hard is not knowing what happened to people after working with them. Um, so I'm so glad you're you're here and writing. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Yeah. And next, I'm going to have uh, Sarah, my daughter in law, read a poem. Um, so Sarah, if you could come on. Um, and this is also in the book. Sarah. Thank you for having me read. Um, I'm excited to share in this. And for me, um, poetry has always been this sort of language for the unheard and the oppressed in a society. So this is very cool to be a part of this. Um, this is called I Continue to Rise. It's on page 10. At the bottom of the mysterious ocean is where my rise began. Full of lies and broken promises, I began to rise. As I learn about me and the great person I really am, I continue to rise. As I look in the mirror and like the person I see, I continue to rise to the person I know I can be. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. And one of the ways that we worked with people was I would read poetry like Maya Angelou um, and then they would write something in response and that was one of them. So, and the next person who's gonna read is Shadwick. He's got two poems he's reading from the book. Hey, hey, hey everybody. Thank you, uh, Michael, Mike for, for uh, sharing that poem. That was awesome. I really love the uh, internal rhyme and the alliteration. This is what it means to be a man by anonymous number 18. Broken bones, chains, hammers, tractors and guns, scraped knuckles, trips to the ER, hunting, fishing, and cold brew, or big trucks on big wheels. This is what it means to be a man. Or is it? Playing dolls with your little girl, Lego blocks and video games, kissing them good night every night, burning a casserole but serving love, watching a sappy movie with the wife or taking her close and holding her tight. This is the life of a man. Don't miss it. Beautiful, thank you. And next is the, uh, the eponymous poem, the title track, if you will, if, if we're talking music lingo. This is The Junkie Who Loved Horses by Travis. My name is Travis. I'm a street junkie. I like horseback riding. For three long years, I had a bunkie. Riding on horses so wild and free, my mom always said, be all you can be. Eight felonies later, I'm cursed with a past. Unlike my horses, not so free, not so fast. Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. I prayed and I prayed, but didn't know what to say. I'm from the country, away from all the harm but suddenly found myself sitting at the rotary farm. I'm now focused and determined to do the next right thing, to hear something so simple, to listen to a bird sing. I've learned so much through my sobriety journey, armed with the facts 
to never leave on a gurney. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I, when you're reading it, I can, I can see that guy's face still. Um, thank you. All right. Um, let's see, I'm going to read a couple more and then we can have some discussion. Um, and uh, this one's called Set Me Free. Some of these have names. You know, I gathered these for eight, eight years. Um, and many, many times there was no name on the paper and we had no way of knowing. Also, because it was a program of um, uh, people struggling with alcoholism and addiction, it was anonymous. So it was up to that person whether they wanted to identify themselves. Anyway, this one does have a name, Set Me Free by Daquan. Break the chains and set me free. This is not the person I want to be. Forget the mule, keep the acres, just give me space, pen, and paper. Project baby snatched away, my mom's disease had come to play. It juggled her life, her kids, her home. Only one is left, the rest are gone. 20 years later, I still hold the leaves of a broken family and a broken tree. So now I ask with outstretched hands, can someone please come set me free? I'm still seeing Shabbok and Sarah. <laughs> All right, beautiful. Um, okay. I was hoping Reagan would be on. on Reagan, are you on? Okay. Um, I'm going to read this one. Graffiti. Katarina? Katarina? Yes, yes. Ah. Okay, yeah, I think something was something was going funny with the video. No, all um, is well, we, we see okay. you, yeah. Okay, Graffiti by James H. Wrapping artists paint outside the margins, replace the page, add absurdo, add reducto, in the face of line watchers, margins bleed, on center stage, fingers rage, on perpendiculars, secret language, survival codes, Hip hop hope, murals relieve, add riddled wastelands, wipe out decorum, vibrate acrylic screams, project the aerated in 1000 years, disinterred from millennial dirt. A wall may bear its breast, spray paint hieroglyphs for future archeologists to decipher. I love that one. <laughs> um, so a lot of the times what I would do is, um, like I said, read different, different poems. And so a lot of times they would write, like in this case, I never knew is after Nazim Hikmet, who was a Turkish poet who was imprisoned most of his life. And when I would read this poem, it was a very long poem about how much he never knew that he loved certain things, but then when he was in prison, he started to think about them. And that was one that people really, really could relate to. So this one's called, I Never Knew After Nazim Hikmet by Tim. I never knew I loved the smell of her neck. Always just thought it was the feel of her sex. Never knew there was a taste to her skin, but I do know I'll never taste it again. Never knew God was the one who painted the skies. Definitely didn't know they were for you and I. I never knew she loved me, didn't know what it meant. I thought love was based on the money you spent. I never knew there was more to life, never knew there was so much more inside of my wife. Um, gosh, there's, you know, I was going through this and I was like, I wanna read this one, I wanna read this one, but I got about 30 and I was like, okay, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm gonna read a couple light ones. This one, um, and I remember this, this person, uh, Backseat by Joseph. This backseat, so small, so tight and confined, but she's not that tall and damn, she's so fine. Her skin so soft on that tight little body. I kiss her, she bites me where I like it so naughty. Rocking the car, it's fogged up and sweaty. Nothing about this experience was petty. She starts shaking and clenching as she calls out my name. Yeah, this backseat's going in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, you know, there was, a, <laughs> there was nothing they couldn't write about. And I would always say, you can write about absolutely anything. The only thing I won't accept is hate speech, racism, misogyny, homophobia. And you know, it was never really a problem. Only one time uh, when someone uh, said something very negative after uh, a trans woman got up and read her poem. And, and then we had a discussion and most of the guys there were like, yeah, everybody needs to be able to say what they need to say. And it was great. I hardly had to say anything. Um, this one is after the guest house too, it's called, after Rumi, anonymous. I've cleaned out my guest house again, cleaned up the clutter, kicked out the sin. I've opened the windows and let in the light, cast out the darkness, restarted the fight, invited in peace, tranquility and love, opened the door for something above. I'm ready for change, I'm ready again. Now I'll sit patiently and see who comes in. Let's see, I'll just maybe read one more. Um, a wall is a wall after Asada Shakur. A wall is a wall and nothing more. Break it down, climb over or build a door. Once you get past it all seems possible. Once you get past it, you feel unstoppable. All your wrongdoings are like that wall Unless you realize and own them, you'll get past nothing at all. All right, so that's all I'm gonna read for now. Um, and I would love to, any questions you have or comments? That was wonderful, Sonia, thank you so much. And yeah. thank you, Shadwick, and uh, was it Sarah? Mm -hmm. And thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Mike. I don't see Mike, yeah. Yes, thank you, Mike. Yeah. So how amazing. Um, this is one of my favorite accents books ever. And uh, I am really, really proud to have had the opportunity to work with Sonia on it. I would love to hear your questions. If you don't have any, I have a few, but let okay. me see. Let Can me I see ask something? something? Yeah. Is there anybody out there who has the book and has like a particular poem they feel moved to read or talk about or comment on just briefly? Or I would like to read a poem, if that's okay. Of course. Um, here is my favorite. It's called Memories by Anonymous Number One. My memory is long. My forgiveness is short. I remember that day you showed up in court. You told them I hurt you, said I needed help. All the time I was running from the feelings I felt. I found my escape with a needle and belt. Can't say you were wrong can say you were right. Not once did you ask, son, are you all right? You say you forgive me, then bring up the past. What good is forgiveness if in your memory it lasts? Hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Why was that one your favorite? Do you know? Well, it was about the history of trauma that hmm. you know, leads us to do things we long we later regret and we don't understand. Hmm. So um, I'll start us with a question, if that's okay. Uh, well, you said that you worked with them um, with the people for eight years. So that's a lot of poems. How did you choose the ones you chose? Oh my God, that was really challenging. For one, because there were bags and bags and bags of handwritten poems. <laughs> I think there were probably 3000 that we had. Um, and I just, I went through them several times and each time the pile would get smaller. And then I would start kind of making piles when I got to like all the poems that I would have wanted to publish, which would have been maybe 
a thousand. <laughs> I put them in piles like about subject matter and just kind of, you know, style and, um, and then I just kept going. I mean, I don't know how many hours I spent. I don't know how many hours. This is my first anthology. I don't know how people usually do it, but there were a lot of poems. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was based somewhat on making sure there was, it really represented all the topics people were writing about, um, you know, uh, so that it wouldn't be heavily weighted. Like I had a lot of where, where I am from poems. Mm -hmm. Those are wonderful. There's a few in the book, but I didn't want it to be a book of all of those, you know, and it could have been, there were that many. Um, but I wanted it to represent the population of people that I was working with. Um, and of course, you know, most of the poems are anonymous, right. um, but you know, you get a sense of who they are from the poem. And so I just whittled it down, whittled it down. And it was, it was difficult. It was difficult, but, uh, but I feel good about it. And you know, that's the other thing that I love because I was ready to whittle it down to like 60 poems. And Katarina was like, oh, you can do, you know, close to 120. <laughs> and I was like, yay. <laughs> I didn't have to get rid of any more. <laughs> so thank you for that as well. Um, yeah. And it looks like Michael would love to read another poem and we would love to hear him do that. Let's uh, just unmute yourself, Michael. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I remember I read another one um, after I read mine, of course, because I'm, I enjoy my own stuff. Um, uh, I, I read another one um, right after I got the book. It, it's on page 22. It's called Have You Ever by Jackie S. And uh, I really related to this piece a lot. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Uh, have you ever sat in a bar looking for answers at the bottom of a whiskey glass, listening to the whistle of a midnight train as you do another line of cocaine? I have. Have you ever worn long sleeves to cover up the tracks, hung your head in shame to cover up the guilt and pain? I have. Have you ever listened to your family cry and voice their concern as you lie and argue for them not to worry? Listen to them beg you to stay as you turn and walk away. I have. Have you ever been in a six by nine cell, feeling lost and lonely as hell, taking a shower just to cry in private so no one in your cell calls you a coward? I have. Have you ever woke up in a cold sweat screaming your best friend's name, asking why you were left to live this life of pain, wishing you could swap places with them so you didn't have to lose sleep seeing their faces? I have. Have you have you wondered why boys are sent to war to die in countries so far away by rich politicians and government officials who never even cared to know their names for a country that forgets their sacrifice in a day? I have. Have you ever been in a crowded room with family, friends, and loved ones, yet felt so empty within, your body only physically there, while your mind is a million miles away in that war that they have long forgotten? Yet I have not. Mm. Yeah, I love that one too. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. No problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question for Sonia, unless there is someone who wants to ask another, uh, is have you written about them? They have written about you, but have you written about them? I have not. Um, you know, I really haven't written anything in, in quite some time. Um, and, you know, it's like many things in life. You know, the last time I was in there was March. I don't know the date. And I remember even thinking, yeah, I could do this for the rest of my life. And then, of course, the pandemic came and it was gone. Um, and then, you know, the uprising in Louisville against racism and police brutality and for justice began. And I've been deeply involved in that. And um, I think things are percolating in me. <laughs> I think I'll be writing at some point. And it's like some of the um, moments I've had during this, this uprising have been very connected to the work I was doing with um, a lot of these men, because really, um, 
you know, they talked a lot about uh, feeling thrown away by society, you know, and uh, being in, in poverty and, uh, you know, ha having a very hard time going back in because we don't offer support to people coming out of prison. Um, and prison in a way is, a, is the institution that deals with so much injustice, you know, because a lot of the reasons people are in prison come out of being in a deeply, deeply unjust system. Um, and so it's very connected and that's a long answer, but I, I think it's all kind of percolating in there because I was so moved and like having Mike be on this call too and read his poem and read someone else's, um, there's that connection again. Um, so, so yeah, I, I will, there will be space for that at some point, you know, and the other funny thing that happened is the more I worked with these different groups, the less writing my own stuff was as important, which is weird. Like I, I want there to be room for, for all of it, but it just, it just, you know, for a while, that's where my focus was and that's okay. I think we move around creatively, you know? Um, and like I said, it really restored my faith in poetry in the power of poetry. So, so yeah. Um, I think Carla looks like she's got a poem she wants to read. <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, I'll get you later. <laughs> um, does anybody else or any other questions or Katarina? I would, uh, I would read another one that I like a lot. It's, a, it's kind of a funny one. Okay, finish. funny's good. Okay. It's called Where's My Weed Whacker? And it's called <laughs> oh, God. So Where's My Weed Whacker? I'm pretty, pretty nuts about this one. It's on page 53. Where's My Weed Whacker by JPM. Dear PMS, please leave my girl alone today. I tried to have company, but my friends cannot come to play. Yes, I know the interior is out the car. It's not my fault. I had to fix the VCR. I know there is a lawnmower taken apart on the couch. Dear PMS, will you please just leave my house? Baby, where's my weed whacker? <laughs> Response by Anonymous 18A. When I was younger, I wanted to be an animal tracker. It didn't work out. So I tried to become a computer hacker. It worked out well because on eBay, I found Milby's weed whacker. This alien came to my house. He told me he needed to hide on my couch. I told him no, because I'm a computer hacker. I told him I knew he stole Milby's weed whacker just to see what the alien would say. That's when the alien told me, Milby's wife put it on eBay. <laughs> this, this series of the weed whacker, usually back, back in the beginning, the guys would be there for six months, three months to six months. And the weed whacker theme went on and on. <laughs> and each week there was a new weed whacker poem. It was awesome. <laughs> and that, that one had a, you know, it was call and response <laughs> about the weed whacker. So thank you for reading that. That was wonderful. All right. I have, um, I, I have a question about your work and it is what does working with new poets, people with less experience, uh, what did that teach about your own work and about your own writing? You did say that it kind of shifted focus for you, but I want to take the focus now towards you and your writing. And maybe after, the, after you answer this question, you can read several of your poems. I think that your voice is just as important for this call and we want to hear your work. Um, I, I really think that, you know, it's funny because uh, I went to uh, a program with, I mean, that's where I met you, master's program um, in writing, creative writing. And it was wonderful. It was wonderful for me. It really helped me put the focus on my writing, meet wonderful writers, you know, uh, and gain some skill. Um, and at the same time, I remember the very first big session we had as a whole group and the director of their program said, 
you can't write about the Iraq war. There are just some things you can't write about, you know? And I remember just feeling like, how am I gonna deal with this program? <laughs> That's how it starts. <laughs> um, but I found teachers to work with who, who valued whatever I was gonna write about. You know, and I think the thinking behind that was you couldn't write about it because you weren't in it. You couldn't write about it in any authentic way. I think anything that's very heavy is hard to write about. Love is hard to write about without being cliche and, and all right. that stuff. Um, but you know, no one's gonna tell you don't ever write about love, right? Um, so the way that I think working uh, with the men's program at the VOA influenced me is it gave me more freedom, I think. Um, in fact, I played with rhyming some because no matter how many times I would say poetry doesn't have to rhyme, everybody wanted to rhyme. You know, it's just how we first learned poetry, right? Um, and uh, so it gave me more freedom and I just felt like the, the subject matter was closer to my heart. People were writing about really real stuff um, that was happening in their lives and being very open about it. And it wasn't the impetus was more about healing and expression rather than trying to impress anybody. And that was very moving to me and important to me in terms of getting deeper in my own work. Um, and then there was just the freshness of language. I mean, really, one day we wrote down on the blackboard all of the sayings that come from the countryside and from Kentucky, you know, rural Kentucky and just sayings that we're losing. And uh, it was amazing. Um, I'm trying to remember some of them. <laughs> so the only one I can remember is happier than a two peckered goat. <laughs> but um, there were others. <laughs> um, you know, there was no subject off limits, like I said, and people were respectful, you know. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I'm going off on another tangent, but um, yeah, I do feel like it, it, it informed my thinking as well as my writing in a deep way so yeah oh carla has her hand up <laughs> yeah i i love this one um because it's really about what you brought sonia and the program and it's called it's 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 funny and i can't sing shadwick would probably do a better job with this one but it's a song by chucko joshua w Wesky V to the tune of Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing. And it's when I get that feeling, I need arts and healing. I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling bad, but I found out it's Friday and I'm oh so glad. We got these ladies that dedicate their time up every Friday so we can write these rhymes. When I get that feeling, I need arts and healing. Now my mind is right so I can fight this fight of addiction, baby. To my addictions, I can say goodbye. So when I leave here, I can stay out this time. When I get this feeling, I need arts and healing, arts and healing, baby. <laughs> oh. Sweet, sweet poem to like what this program meant. And it's connected to something very serious, which is, you know, struggling with addiction so anyway i love that one yes oh uh, thank you so much for bringing that one in because i can still see them they were giggling they said well you have a song so all three of these guys got up and they they sang it to that tune and it was it was beautiful and wonderful i mean those were the moments of real joy you know where everybody's kind of singing along and yes so thank you for bringing that one appreciate it yeah Yes, yes, it wasn't all intensity. There was a lot of playfulness and joy. And oftentimes it came after the ones that they read with tears coming down their faces. You know, I, I think that was just such a powerful, powerful thing to have all your feelings. I mean, that's what, you know, when we're, and I myself am an addict and alcoholic, sober 33 years, just celebrated. Um, but you know, you're, you're not having any of those feelings, any of them. It's not just that you don't feel the pain you don't feel the joy either. So, so yeah, that's wonderful, thanks. It's all about reclaiming it, having that space. All right. What will you read for us, Sonia? Oh. <laughs> I love you, Katarina. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, since I've talked about that, uh, what happened in, the, in my first week in the program, I'm going to read. Um, oh, I think it's in, sorry, um, in this one. Um, let's see if I can find it. I, I did not have it ready, and now I can't find it. Um, so I'll read something else. Uh, and since Carla just read that, I was stuck on my writing, and Carla said, write about gardening in Baghdad. This is while we were still bombing Iraq. So I wrote uh, a persona poem called Planting a Garden in Baghdad. Ours was the land of dates and pomegranates. Now the pomegranates are heads split open that spill seed into the road. I've tried to plant them in hope that they will grow back, but the earth is full of metal, Shrapnel seedlings sprout up everywhere. Napalm makes poor compost. Its burning heat kills the seeds. Tanks eat my flowers because there is no food. I've tried using rebar for fencing, but scraps of flesh hang there, discourage root development. I watch the display of phosphorus over my city. It's spray of luminosity, enough light to garden by or burn, whichever comes first. Um, Katarina, do you have a, have a request? You know my work. <laughs> Let's see. Anything that you read from your chat books is fantastic. Okay. Uh, I found the one I was talking about. This is not a poem about the war since I'm not allowed to write about that. <laughs> this is not a poem about the war. This is not a poem about horses that ran through a small town, their bodies slick with oil, or the boy with no arms who tried to catch them. This is not a poem about scrolls and books and artifacts tossed into bonfires nor the old woman who carried them to safety, the tips of her fingers burned and ashes in her mouth. There is no syntax to match the face of a father or sister told it was friendly fire and there is no body to send home. There is no metaphor for torture, no sonnet to hold mass graves, no line break to address our culpability on the pristine white page. It's kind of a... A little bit of an F you. <laughs> um, see, do we have time for one more? Yes, one more would be great. Can I, uh, can I read somebody else's poem that I love that has just been keeping me company in these last few months? Absolutely. Okay. And I think you know this poet, Ross Gay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this poem is called A Small Needful Fact. And for those who don't know, um, Eric Garner comes up in this poem and um, he was killed by the police in uh, 2014. He was selling cigarettes without a license and they put him in a chokehold and um, killed him. A Small Needful Fact by Ross Gay. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticulture Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants, which most likely some of them in all likelihood continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you everyone for being here. And uh, whoever is interested in obtaining a copy of the book, please contact Sonia directly. Uh, do you wanna put your- Yeah, I forgot about that part. I'm, I'm so bad about that. <laughs> um, and in fact, I was gonna donate um, any profits from the book to a new uh, group called the Black Women's Collective. Um, so, or if you want to buy books for the VOA, 
um, you could buy them and have me donate them to the VOA. Or if you just want them for yourself, that's fine too. But thank everybody for being here. Thank you all for reading. Um, Shadwick and Sarah, I think, are gone. Um, Carla, still here somewhere, maybe? Um, and Mike, thank you so much. And Katerina, you know I love you. Thank you. I love you too, Sonia. Thank you all.